first thing we wanted to kind of touch on here is, you know, kind of level of detail in terms of buildings. And, you know, a lot of people talk about that, um, you know, kind of what, what level of detail do you have? And it's really kind of, for the most part, standardized into four levels from zero to four. And, you know, kind of each of these levels and depending on, you know, really depend on what kind of use case scenarios you have, um, you know, to, to utilize the building structure uh, information for. So kind of depending on, you know, what that is would kind of depend on which level of detail you would really want to have within your systems. Um, and we'll go into a little bit more detail on each of these. Um, you know, so this is just kind of, uh, you know, a high level showing you going from kind of just your flat 2D all the way up to, you know, kind of really that architectural BIM type modeling. Um, okay, so go to the next slide. Yeah, okay, there we are. Um, so, you know, one of the things we think about when we're talking about level of detail um, and we, you know, come up with our, our use case and what level we need, then we have to decide on what information do we need to have to, to match that model to be able to create it. So um, if we're talking about just, you know, a level of detail zero, which is really just your, your standard footprint, you know, just regular, you know, based imagery orthos is going to be good enough. But if you want to start moving up into the 3D modeling and things like that, then you're going to need to have those additional model uh, capabilities, elevation, things like that. So, you know, that's where you're going to start looking at, you know, your, uh, you know, LIDAR and your oblique imagery. And then when you get up even higher into the, um, you know, more detailed models of level three and four, you know, that's where you're really going to want, you know, much higher accuracy, ground LIDAR, you know, actual, you know, BIM modeling or, you know, the building plans, things like that, that you could then um, actually create those really, really detailed uh, data um, points from. Uh, okay, so let's, let's talk about those actual level of details and, you know, for level of detail zero, um, you know, pretty sure everybody's familiar with that. That's, you know, the most standard, well-used type of uh, scenario. And it's, it's really, really good for, you know, your standard uh, based analysis of, you know, how much uh, building structure do I have per parcel or, you know, what's my setback from, you know, the uh, parcel line, things like that. Um, once we go to the level uh, one, you know, we're, we're starting to move up. And, you know, for that, we need to have some sort of vertical uh, information. And that starts giving us a good perspective on at least, uh, you know, a 3D um, image. Do I have, you know, tall buildings here? Are they lower buildings? Um, things like that, you know, you, you could start assessing, um, you know, do I have codes? Am I near an airport? Will this start impacting? Um, you know, so, so you start to get a good perspective on that type of information out of your buildings. Uh, okay, let's go here, next level. So the level two, again, it's still kind of sugar QV, but your buildings are, in this case, really broken down more into a little bit more individual components. Um, so if there are, uh, you know, kind of cutout areas or courtyards, you know, you have the ability to kind of show that a little bit more distinctly. Um, you know, you have a uh, different number of stories for different section of the buildings you'll be able to show that. So you, you're, you're kind of having a little bit more discretion in terms of how that building is shown and the information that you could obtain from that. Um, you know, and again, you're, you're starting to be able to get into better analysis, um, you know, kind of a wind tunnel analysis type scenario. Um, you know, you, you're getting better, better models from that. Um, you start 
getting into decent line of sight uh, capabilities uh, at that level, you know, where, you know, this is starting to be able to plan for events, things like that, where you could have, um, you know, good information modeling from that. Um, level three, we're starting to get into uh, a little bit more complex modeling um, where, you know, specifically on the roof structures, now we're not really just talking about extruded type data um, and, and just showing as flat roofs. We're actually showing more of the architectural uh, design of the roof, so sloped roofs, things like that. And this really um, enhances our ability to utilize a those building structure informations for things like um, solar analysis, right? So if you want to get solar panels up on your roof, um, you know, there's a big difference if it's a flat roof or if it's a, a sloped roof, um, which way is that roof uh, sloped? Um, which way is it facing? How much slope? These things will determine how much utilization of solar panels that you could get. So, you know, that, um, you know, that type of information really increases your ability to do those types of information analysis. Uh, and a lot of that's going to be, um, you know, kind of a jump up in information needed also. So for this, you really would be looking at more of a LIDAR data set or, uh, you know, kind of something compiled from stereometric imagery. Okay, next. And we get to um, you know kind of some more of this fun stuff, the LOD four. Um, you know this is really kind of you know kind of our top level buildings, um, and these are the things where we really have those kind of BIM modeling uh, capabilities. We've really gone in, and um, you know you really have room by room structure. Um, filled out within those buildings in addition to all the other architectural exterior information. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, you probably have more detailed roof structure information. So on a level three, you might not have um, chimneys or something like that. But on an LOD4, you would, you know, fill out all that additional uh, data points, you know, within that architectural model. Um, and then also within the LOD4, you would you know, probably have um, you know, all of those interior um, use cases that you would have. Um, obviously, in, in our little uh, video here, you can see all the chairs and the tables. So you could really um, you know, get utilization in terms of um, planning, um, you know, obviously for emergency response, this type of level of detail would be um, you know, really good. So you would have an understanding of, you know, where the structure um, is, where the different rooms are, stairways, things like that, um, you know, which gives a, uh, you know, a great ability to really understand how to get in and out of structures. Okay, so let's go next. So the digital twin. So this is kind of going a little bit past just buildings. Um, you know, digital twin is another one of those great words that people like to use. And, you know, it's, it's an encompassing using all that building information, but also using all the auxiliary uh, data points also. So, you know, with that, you would have all your ground features, you know, your, your trees and shrubs and all of that would, would hopefully be modeled. And this gives almost a virtual reality to um, the location that you have this as, you know, whether it's the whole city or just, um, you know, specific locations. Uh, you know, with that, you could also, you know, integrate secondary data sources, um, you know, live streams and all these types of uh, information that is out there that you can, you know, really utilize and as an immersive um, experience to really understand exactly, you know, what's going on at any particular location. And it, it takes the data that you have, but also combines it into, you um, Kind of a live experience, also. So it's it's almost a real time 
uh, data stream. So you can understand exactly what's happening. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, at, at a high level, again, you know, event planning, things like that, um, as well as just general, you know, planning, this really gives you a very, very high level of, you know, if you add a new building or if you're going to put in a new road, um, if you're going to have a parade, all of those types of things, um, this enables you at the most high level to be able to plan that out and understand any of those impacts by making those changes and observing that um, you know, kind of almost in a real time environment. Okay. All right, we're going to take a quick break and do a quick audience poll. Give me one second to get this poll up. All right, so I have just launched, launched our first audience poll. We want to hear from you to know what, what level of detail are your buildings that you currently have topic. Um, so far, we're seeing a lot of LOD zeros, which is just the flat heating uh, building footprint itself. It's got a couple of LOD ones in there. Seeing some LOD twos and threes now. Yeah, so our majority is at 75%. Just through the results, if anybody's going to pop up, you can just close that pop up when you're done checking out LOD results there. But typically, kind of what we expected to see a lot of LOD zeros in this poll. Um, but super exciting to see that there are a couple of you that are starting to get into this TV world with LOD 1 plus. All right, so let's keep going. Next, we're going to talk about the automated concepts for future extraction. This is the cool stuff. Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to shift gears a little bit um, and, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, how do we get, and, you know, obviously we're, we're talking about buildings mostly, but, um, you know, we'll kind of branch out into some other types of features also. But, uh, you know, how do you get that data? You know, how do you create those building footprints and, and other things? And traditionally that's, you know, planometrics or head up, heads up type thing or raster vector. Um, but, you know, now the, the ability for utilization of computers and, you know, these, these terminologies that we have now, the AI and the ML and the DL, you know, all of those things, um, provide you know a much larger capability um and you know and, and ability to do this um you know using the computer and extracting out that information um similar to traditional methods um you know these are constantly improving at a very rapid rate um, they do depend on the inputs that you have just as if you were doing it by hand and uh, training helps Right. So, um, all right. So, we'll talk a little bit more about the differences of these. I mean, the slide kind of has those, but let's go to the next slide. And, yep. Okay. There we go. So, you know, the other slide kind of showed it as, you know, top down. This kind of gives it a little bit different perspective of, you know, the relationships between these different models where artificial intelligence kind of, uh, is the overall uh, description of, you know, utilizing computers to, uh, you know, replicate, you know, how a human would be doing something in our case. Um, you know, how, how do we get uh, data out of other things, mostly imagery, but how does that happen? So, you know, just using it at the highest level, um, you know, an artificial intelligent kind of uh, approach would really just be kind of like, hey, have I seen that? Is it the same thing? You know, so do I have a picture 
you know, is it a picture of a fish? Do I have that same picture? Yes or no. We're going into a little bit more of the machine learning models and using, you know, a little bit more of an algorithm and statistical approach to things. It looks at, you know, okay, maybe it's not the same picture, but it's basically the same shape same color so yeah i could i could kind of match that you know it's a fish here but it's the same fish it's just at a different size or scale uh, as we move into kind of the the next level which is deep learning that's using a little bit more um, advanced analysis um, kind of a, a neural network which replicates more of a human thought pattern of you know decision tree making and you know so it, it gives more of the ability to really hone in on uh, certain aspects so it's not just looking at um, you know is it you know a similar size and shape but it's looking at um, I can identify different pieces of it it has eyes it has fins it has scales um, it has different color patterns um, based on that, I can tell it's a fish and it's a fish of certain type. Um, and depending on how well things are trained um, would depend on what level um, you, know, you could get down to and, and really kind of any of these models. So, you know, the more you train it, the more you show it, um, you know, kind of, you know, particular type of input, the more that it can understand. Um, you know, so an example today, of course, is, um, you know, or at least one of the examples is, you know, music. There's a lot of talk about the AI creating songs and getting trained on these, you know, music catalogs. And it's just not a couple songs. It's tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of songs that it looks through to be able to replicate and come up with something. Okay, so based on that, um, you know, utilizing, you know, these methods, it's, it's um, you know, it's very beneficial. You can utilize that to, you know, like we said, extract features, but instead of somebody sitting there and panning through and looking at things, um, we can utilize the computer, train it, and look at specific things so we can look at you know buildings or we can tell it to look at the vegetation um you know we can look for specific things just like pools like in, in our example here um you know once we have something identified then we could cross-reference that between different data sets and try and understand um you know how, how you know first off we would want to know you know okay based on the pools that we know exist did it find all of those. Um, and for the pools that we don't know exist, um, you know, how many did it find? Things like that. Um, yeah, so overall there's, there's, you know, really no, um, you know, kind of cap on what you can do and how you could utilize that. Um, you know, and again, this is a great example of a, a way to use this for change detection would be buildings, right? If you have an existing building data set and you got new imagery, create a new building data set and compare the two, try and find out gaps or changes to buildings and things like that. What I find so interesting about this too for the, the actual feature extraction is that for pools, they can be all different shapes and sizes. They're above ground, they're below ground. You can see here that you have some lighter shades of blue for the pool, but then you have that one on the left side that's a really dark, dark navy blue almost. So for it to be intelligent enough to be able to pick up those differences in size and shape and color is so fascinating to me. <laughs> all right. Moving on to our next audience poll, um, we want to hear from you to see if uh, any of your data has been extracted via these automated techniques um, versus the traditional heads up digitizing um, and ways like that. So let me get this second poll started. Launch and just a simple yes or no question. Um, once we get in there, I, I think I know what most of our answers are going to be, but I'm excited to see the results here.
So far, we're at 70% for no's and 30% for yes. We've got about well, just over half of the audience putting in uh, responses. That's very impressive, though. <laughs> All right, we're holding steady right there. So we've got 73% for no and 27%. So I'll share those results for everyone to see. It's kind of what we expected, I think, Chris, um, to hear that a lot of them are not using the automated techniques just yet, um, but super exciting to see that there are 27% that are, so. Mm -hmm. All right, close that one out. And we'll keep on moving along. We're going to talk about some use cases and different analyses that we've done um, here at Sanborn with some building data. Chris, you're up first. <laughs> sure, sure. I'll keep going. Um, all right. So, yeah, we talked a little bit about change detection and um, that utilization. And, you know, change detection really, when it comes down to it, is looking at you know, a before and an after, two two vintages of data, and is there any change to that data? Um, you know, so this this example is um, on the, on the right. You know, is, is a great example of kind of two things. Well, one, um, you know, there there well three things I should say. So one, you know, the building is is definitely larger. Um, you know, it looks like a tree or, or some vegetation was removed and then there's a pool. So, you know, there, there's a lot going on there. Um, and even just below that circle, it looks like there was a pool and it was, um, you know, removed. So, you know, the, the, um, the ability to kind of look at this stuff, um, you know, kind of in a visual way is one, but being able to, you know, try and automate this is, um, you know, that's that's a very exciting way to be able to to start moving into, uh, you know, this type of data. If you go through and you create from those two years, uh, you know, a data set for pools, um, you know, in this example, then, you know, you, it's a good way to be able to um, identify that quickly. Um, and then, you know, another uh, example and you know on the bottom we can see okay you know uh, a second story was you know kind of expanded upon on the building and this is a little bit more tricky of a data point to gather um, you know especially since most data are, are auth ortho images so you know to to be able to kind of extract this type of information you would need kind of two vintages of you know, decent quality LIDAR, decent uh, oblique imagery that you can post-process and, and obtain that, you know, vertical analysis to obtain that change. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, change detection is one of those really, um, you know, exciting use cases for, um, you know, automation and, and, you know, utilizing, you know, 2D and 3D data, um, yeah, to, to kind of identify where changes are occurring. And then obviously you, know, you could cross-reference that with, um, you know, permits and things like that. Here we go, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, I was just looking at the some of the comments here, um, but uh, okay. So, um, you know, again, here's a, a more, traditional change detection um, use case where, you know, kind of analyzing the pre and the post year one, year two, to, you know, identify new construction or, um, you know, building changes. And, you know, in this case, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, shows up fairly obvious, you know, some fairly large construction going on in this location, but, you know, that kind of use case really shows up, um, you know, fairly well. Um, you know, kind of one thing, you know, running this analysis that we, um, you know, also kind of figured out is that, you know, in some cases, what we were able to identify were changes into, uh, 
the roofing. And from that, we could, uh, you know, kind of honed in and looked for kind of, okay, where were things added, such as solar panels? So um, there's kind of an angled building kind of on the bottom right-ish there, um, you know, and then the change map that those kind of black spots are highlighted as, you know, changes to that roof, um, you know, kind of additions to solar panels. So, you know, again, some of those things you might not think about. And then, you know, as you run through some of these um, processes, you, you start to identify different ways to utilize that. Something I'm surprised of, and I'm not sure how common this is, but you can see in the year one that everything looks pretty dry versus year two. Like this is a very large either retention basin or something. And I'm surprised that the it's the LIDAR and the imagery and detection is smart enough to pick that up as not necessarily being a change to the environment, but just that it's not a race structure and, and different things like that. So I just find that interesting. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay, so, you know, this, this is more of a, um, you know, how do we use some of that automated extraction um, technology and, you know, you know, how would we utilize that? And, you know, I, I think if you look at it, um, it's, you know, at, at a high level, it's very accurate. Now, obviously, you know, the building details are a little bit off and things like that. But, you know, when you're looking at, you know, land use and, you know, you want to understand, you know, at a, at a higher level, you know, how much tree canopy do we have? You know, how much um, low vegetation, barren surfaces, pervious, impervious, um, you know, these types of analysis, um, you know, while it, you know, certainly at a planimetric level, you can get a far higher accuracy. Um, and then coupling this with existing, you know, say road networks and things, you know, building footprints and things like that you know, you could certainly increase that accuracy also. But, you know, when, when you're trying to understand that, uh, you know, the lay of the land, you know, these are types of things that can be done, you know, fairly effectively at this point. And, you know, again, this technology is, you know, really improving, you know, kind of on a monthly basis almost. And, uh, yeah, I, you know, go all the way back sort of to the begin beginning and we start talking about level of details and, um, you know, kind of one of the things I, I like to spend some time on is, you know, the, the NINA requirements and, um, you know, some of those work groups and, you know, specifically talking about the, uh, you know, GIS data and the 3D input uh, you know, data, especially moving into the next gen 911 stuff, where, you know, the new models and the new, um, you know, data structures are, are being designed to allow for that 3D capability. So having, you know, some of those additional capabilities within, you know, certainly the, the building data sets and then the site structure address points, um, you know, to be, you know, even more specific, we're kind of, you know, in the past, we might have had a single point for, you know, a, a larger structure, um, you know, now those, you know, can really be broken down to entry points, okay. egress, you know, entrances for the doors, um, you know, maybe even emergency entrances, um, you know, different common rooms, different apartments, um, you know, and that information, you know, even by by level, um, you know, can really, you know, eventually work to, you know, a very high advantage to the, you know, first responders and understanding, you know, exactly where and what's the best way to get to any particular uh, incident. Um, you know, so, you know, when we when we look at all this stuff together, you know, to me, this is kind of like, you know, one of the, you know, great ways to utilize uh, GIS data is to, you know, first responders and, you know, help people out, so. All right, I think, Rebecca, you're- Yeah, 
I'm going to take it from here. So we've kind of touched on base maps a little bit. Uh, I think most people are familiar with our MapGeo product now. Um, we have a lot of different base map configurations. So a couple of examples, the very far left and the very far right are both examples from MapGeo from two of our different clients um, in Connecticut. And the one on the left you can see is just very sparse. They are just showing their buildings. Um, and they also have some other underlying base map layers as well for their flagged wetlands and swamp and water areas. But then on the right side, um, they also are showing the roadway network and they've configured it so that it's also pulling in some Google data as well as what they already have in their planimetric data that had been captured uh, for the town. So they've got, um, you can't see it here because I'm zoomed out a little too far, but I wanted to get a high level view of everything. But they also have deeper have their sidewalks and driveways, parking lots, um, all of their impervious area and surfaces are all uh, covered in their base map, um, which you can kind of see in that middle one down below that it's the it, those are for the same town and they have all of their information in their tax maps, uh, which is used by the assessor. Um, I think they have hard copies hanging up uh, in the filing cabinets for people and public and staff to use, and they can also see where those impervious surfaces are, as well as where the buildings are. Um, and like Chris said, um, when we're trying to get into the addressing information, that plays a component uh, as well for them. So another analysis that, analysis that we've done was looking at the uh, FEMA 100-year flood zone, as well as the local wetlands layer that they have for the town. Um, and they wanted to do an analysis as things were change, changing with FEMA. Um, and they also changed the regulations from a 100 uh, foot regulated upland review area to 150 feet. So they wanted to know the impact of making that change in town. So they wanted to know all of the parcels that were affected, but also importantly, what buildings and structures were now going to be affected by increasing the size uh, of 50, by 50 feet for their upward review area. So this is what some of that, the pink is showing. It's showing the uh, area that has now been changed. All of the yellow parcels are parcels that affected. And then all of the red buildings are obviously buildings that are affected by the increase in the upland review area. Um, another project that we are working on, uh, we're working on a flood risk analysis. So we have an inventory of all of their buildings, as well as getting the FEMA flood zone uh, elevation uh, cross-section models. So here you can see we have this in a 3D map. You can kind of see the terrain a little bit where the deepness of that stream or river is, um, and kind of what buildings are going to be affected within that 100-year flood zone. So. We're working with the city to currently identify any critical structures. Um, so if there's any hospitals, schools, municipal buildings, um, things like that, that are higher risk than just the residential buildings, um, we're working on that project right now. So this has been really, really interesting to see, especially at the 3D level too. Um, those are just a few use cases for sure. There are definitely other use cases that you can uh, use the building data for. We've listed out a couple right here, um, but buildings really are a key piece of any GIS information, particularly to the cadastral and the assessor's database, but obviously there are a hundred more uses for building data. So with that, we have our last audience poll. Um, and if you can throw your answers to this question in the chat box, we'll take a look at some of those that come through. But we want to know what other use cases you've done with your, um, in your organization with buildings data. So we'll give folks a, a minute to throw some answers in the chat box or the q and I have both of them up, so throw things in there. Um, while people are answering that, we'll kind of keep moving on, take a look at those answers afterwards. Um, that does wrap up our webinar. So uh, there are several, many different use cases for buildings, um, just from the basic understanding of what you can do with buildings to the feature extraction, and then to running different processes um, for that data. So we're the experts, we are here to help. Um, everything that we've talked about, we have, we have done for multiple, multiple clients. So reach out to us. So our contact information is here and we will open it up to some questions. We already have a few that are in our chat box. So let's see, let's start at the top. Um, for change detection, what are typical data sets that Sanborn uses with or for municipal clients to ID changes? 
Um, okay, well, I'll, I'll kind of take that. Um, I mean, I, I think we've kind of utilized quite a few different data sets. So, you know, that's going to depend on, you know, what any one particular customer has. So talked a little bit about the 3D type of stuff. So having a, you know, pre and post data set for that, whether it's a you know, DEM, DTM type data or a LIDAR data set, um, you know, we, we've utilized, you know, that type of information. Um, one thing to kind of keep in mind, the more similar those data points are, the better. So if you have kind of, you know, a LIDAR data set at, you know, three points per meter, that's an older one versus a new one that's kind of eight points per meter, um, you know, and, and kind of at different accuracy levels that could, um, you know, make a, add, add some challenges to the uh, ability to do those changes. Um, you know, we've also gone image to image um, or taken some new imagery and created new building footprints, comparing that to an existing data set. Um, and so those are just some of the initial ones that are off the top of my head there. Um, yeah, I think that also answers one of the other questions too. The, the best, it, it seems to me that the best way to capture change detection is multiple years of LiDAR flown. Doesn't necessarily have to be LiDAR. Um, with the LiDAR, you do get additional types of changes that get detected, but you can certainly just do it with regular ortho uh, ortho imagery as well. Yeah, and then um, it's going to depend on what you're looking for. So uh, looking for pools, LiDAR might or might not be your best option, um, you know, if that's what you're looking to, to identify. Um, that was the last question that we had. My apologies, the chat is disabled and I'm not sure how to enable it. So my apologies on there, but we did get one person to chime in to say that one use case that they had was to determine occupancy, um, which is an interesting, interesting way of using buildings that I hadn't really thought of. So um, if yep. anybody has any other questions or comments about today's webinar, reach out to our email um, and we will get back to you. But thank you so much for attending and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you.